This is a bit overwhelming and what a wonderful, wonderful evening. Um, Campus Rector, Vice Rector, Dean Humanities, Director of School of Behavioral Science, Director of Tentia, Director of School of Management Science, Program and Sub-Program Leaders, Executive Management, Faculty Deans, Professors, Doctors, Alumni on the Campus, University Staff, Lynn, my son Daniel, and all protocol observed. Good evening. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you very, very much. I um, am new to academia. I've only been in academia for some few years. And uh, the first advice I got was blunt, brutal, and straightforward. And I only got two pieces of advice. The first was publish or perish. <laughs> and the second was good research starts with a good question. So the first piece of advice scared the hell out of me. So I started writing articles and publishing and writing books. And I had to learn what a peer-reviewed journal was because um, I used to write for HR Future and People Dynamics. And they said, no, those don't count. And I, what do you mean they don't count? No, they don't count. You've got to <laughs> write to peer-reviewed journals. And then I had to say, well, which ones count? And I got a long list and I didn't know where remuneration fitted. Did it fit with... Um, HR or economics or finance, and, and anyway, eventually um, I, I found my way. So I was told to come and present all these 40 articles and do all the Kronbach alphas and the T tests and the chef's test, but, but I, I'm going to deviate from that because if you want that, it's on the internet and you can look it up and just read it. I, I thought I'd tackle the second bit of advice I got, which is. Um, Good research starts with a good question. And all the questions that I have. So maybe I'd pose a whole lot of questions and uh, share with you a journey through the world, my world, um, just so that I can share a little bit of my world with you. And um, so please forgive my deviation from pure academia to a journey of, of the fire. And boy, is it a fire. Because who here feels that they could earn just a little bit more hands up? <laughs> Welcome to the whole world of my world with you. Thank you for listening. I know that there were many other things you could be doing tonight. So, publish is what I did. And lucky for me, I've got more questions than, than articles. So, um, I'd like to share some of those questions with you. Okay, so a, a virtual tour through my world, and um, I'll leave all the empirical research uh, for you to read uh, at your leisure. But here, here are some of the questions. Why, why does the president of South Africa earn 2.6 million rand, and a city mayor or city manager earn 5, 6, or 7 million rand? That's a good question. Why does a university professor not you here, maybe you earn a bit more, but on average earn between 600,000 and 900,000. And I saw an advert in last Sunday Times for a PA for over a million. How does that happen? What, what informs that? What does a CEO do to earn 40 million? What, what do they do? How do you come to 40 million? Why is it not 39 million or 41 million? And how do you set CEO pay, board pay, comparators? How do you set the president's pay? The big thing nowadays is inequality. Everyone's talking about inequality. We are such an unequal society. And um, that's a question that I'd like to give some thoughts on. What is fair pay? Does anyone here have a problem with fair pay? No. So if it's fair, you happy, I'm happy, everyone's happy, the shareholders are happy, the unions are happy. So all we need to do then is set fair pay, right? Well, what is fair pay? That's the question. That's the question. So, so now you can see how all of this starts hooking in with empirical research that's required. And, and that's where I need help from, from real good academics to try and marry 
the practical question to good academic research. And I think that's where we can partner. So if anyone's interested in any of these topics from a research point of view, please <laughs> let's hook up. And, 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 and how much bonus is fair? And how much long-term incentive is fair? And is there a relationship between econ employee value proposition and pay? And I, I don't know, you've heard of Maslow and Hertzberg and Vroom and Lawler, and they all say money doesn't motivate. They, everyone said that. When you do a literature review, they tell you it does not motivate. But when I lecture or I come to forums and, and I go into the mines and I go to Rustenburg and, and I ask people, does money motivate? They all tell me, hell yes. <laughs> And then I start telling them about Hertzberg and, you know, it can't motivate you, but it can stop you from being demotivated. They say, when were these things written? And, and I say, well, 1954. And they say, yeah, but hey, pal, <laughs> you know, get with the program. So I'm not a psychologist, and, and I think they're very good psychologists. And of course, um, maybe there aren't better theories, but, but aren't, aren't we due for some new theories, especially when it comes to money? and motivation. Some people say it was easier back then and it's more difficult now. But I remember my parents saying how difficult it was then as well. So, you know, I don't know if it's easy or difficult, but what I do know is that right now if you offer someone um, a, a lamb bry with a few beers or money to say thank you, 99% would take the money. So, we can't ignore our context. Our context is really important, and what we desperately need is more empirical research uh, on this subject. It, it's the most, probably one of the most under-researched areas in, 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 um, in academia is, is the sole concept of money and remuneration. So the next five or 10 slides talks around our context, and our context is jobs, 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 jobs. And it's not a South African phenomenon. It's, it's an international phenomenon. So the link between remuneration and talent is that talented people leave our schools, they leave our universities, and they can't find jobs. There seems to be a mismatch between what business requires and, and what we're putting out there. And just when I thought that was the last article, along comes another one called Generation Jobless. I mean, imagine you've got Generation X, Generation Y, Generation Jobless. I, how, how insane is this? You know, what, what's going on? And when you take it closer to home, this was on my desk one day, and uh, Daniel, my son at the back, says, Dad, what, what does this mean? What's going on? You know, what, what do you mean there's no jobs? And, and I don't know if you have ever researched the word hope, but when you have no hope, Well, I mean, then, then, then it's bad. And um, so then the question is, I sit next to Patrick Craven, who is the spokesperson for Kasatu, and, and we're good friends. Here now, we are wonderful friends. But philosophically, we differ completely. In a public forum two months ago, I said to him, Patrick, would you rather have high skill, meaningful work and high pay for fewer? Or would you have less meaningful work, less pay for all? And he said, Mark, you can't be asking me that question. You, you run a business, right? I said, yes. He says, um, who, whose pay do you look after? And I said, well, my employees. He said, well, we've got constituents. We've got members. That's whose pay I look after. So, of course, it's the first one. It's meaningful pay, meaningful work for my members. And I filled in the dot, dot, dot for him, not his words. So, to hell with the rest. And he looked at me and that was pretty much like it was. That's what he was saying. So, ideologically, the government, Kasatu, and the captains of industry are not aligned. We, we, we have a, it's a, they're misaligned. Because the government would prefer the second option. How do I speak with such authority? Well, I've got an office in the union buildings. I meet with the president once a quarter in his home. 
And by the way, he took a 0% pay increase this year. <laughs> I won't repeat that. <laughs> but the other thing to take note of is that this is not just white faces, Indian faces. This is everybody. So then McKinsey, I think, are pretty good um, consultants. They say 90 million people are going to lose their job by 2020. That's in six years' time. Six years' time. 90 million is almost double our population. And, and who's eating these jobs? And, and it boils down again to something that the economists call the greatest job mismatch of all time. And what caught my eye is that a big driver of reward management in the future is economics. Economics, <clears throat> supply and demand. And you are putting out the supply. You, we, the universities. And are we putting out the right sort of people? Bless you, you sneezed on the truth. <coughs> so this is the question that I put to Patrick, and this is the question that we all grapple with. What is better? What is the better approach? How does that link to pay and remuneration? Well, basically, if you take a big organization like Standard Bank, and you ask the top directors to take 20% of their pay, they earn about 30, 40 million, just to give you a feel, and give it to the folk lower down, in principle, they don't mind, but in reality, so you earn a lot more than the, the, the clerical workers, right, and, and the cleaners here. Can we take 20% of your pay and, and share it with them? Oh, no, no. <coughs> so, in principle, we do think that folk at the top earn too much and we should give some to the bottom. But Practically, the practical application of that means you've got to give up some of your money, and no one really wants to do it. Why? Because we've all bonded up and card up. And in, just in case you thought the inflation rate was 6%, if you remove housing, which makes up the bulk of that, and you only buy one house every 10 years, basically food and petrol and all of that, inflation is more like 15 to 20%. So over the last two to three years, we've been getting 6 7 8% pay increase the other stuff's gone up by 50%. We, you and me, have all got poorer. Everyone is struggling quite a lot. So if you were to get the next pay increase at 40 or 50% to make up for the last few years, then um, it has to come from somewhere. Are your budgets tight? Yes, so are the rest, rest of Africa's all tight. So we need to do something, more students. And by the way, our growth and our profit come from people as well. So we really need to invest in education and make sure that the HR is working. So what are the top remuneration issues? So that's just by way of context. What are they? Here they are. Inequality is number one, the wage gap. Performance-related pay, the list is in front of you, and I'd like to share some of that. The top trends are all there, and I'm going to spend one minute per trend, just to give you a feel for what the trends are, because these trends are where we get our research questions from, and that's where we do our empirical research. So of the 40 articles, it is true. So I've, I've probably researched and, and supervised maybe 40 or 50 um, PhDs and master's students. And then we're sitting with all this information and being a new academic, I, I don't know what to do with it, so thank goodness for Nicolene. She gives me a good kick up my backside and says, this is and this and this is what you've got to do with it. And Ian made some suggestions as well. So I think it's going to be a wonderful partnership and I look very, very forward. Employee engagement is the number one reward trend in the whole world. If we can just get folk more engaged because we've got psychic absenteeism. I read a piece of research that said the average person works two and a half hours per day. That's it. If you can get that to five hours, you're doing very, very well. Once we've found the right people, because you ask, do you find the right people? Can you find the right people? Everyone says, no, it's tough, it's tough. And then when we find them, we have to retain them. And when you retain them, we're looking for the magic formula. And the Harvard Business Review said the way to retain people is to create the best workplace on planet Earth, the best workplace. And if you don't know what the best workplace on planet Earth is, in this very same Harvard Business Review, 
They gave you a diagnostic Reader's Digest test, 20 questions which you answer, and once you answer them, you'll know how close you are to having the best workplace on earth, and these are the big headings that look um, at whether you've got the best workplace on earth. So if you're looking to create a good workplace, because the workplace, uh, if it's a good workplace, it, it, you don't have to pay people as much or it puts less pressure on the money. I'm more likely to stay in a place that has um, a nice place to work. The second big trend is this concept called total rewards, and it's not just about the money, which is there. It's about other things. And work-life balance is a big one. And by the way, the reason we put in this whole thing of total rewards is to get results, performance and results. So yes, it is nice to pay people more, it is nice to get things done, but the reason we do it is results. And if you unpack remuneration, you can unpack it into four main components. And we do research on each one of these components. And we do... Um, Conjoint analyses, you have to pick this job advert or that job advert, pick this or pick that. And, and that's how we've worked out what we think the ideal employment offer is for um, an employee. And retention trends, money can't keep people. We think that 25%, so based on empirical research, I'm just tying in some empirical research, uh, we, we think that it's 25% of the stay decision. The other 75% of the stay decision is good leadership. <clears throat> if you were going to use remuneration, then this is what you would do, and it's all monetary, but it's only 25%. You can't just throw money at it because cost control is a big problem. And the perception that people earn too much is a big problem. Who here thinks that CEOs in South Africa are overpaid? I, I know it's not a proper survey, but, but just for fun. Who here, yes or no? Who here thinks that CEOs in South Africa are overpaid? Yes and no. <clears throat> I chair probably more remuneration committees than any other African I know. And I sit on these committees and half the committee thinks that the CEO is overpaid and half the committee thinks that they're underpaid. And you have to try and marry these two completely divergent views. And by the way, we don't feel that passionate about office furniture or things like that. But when it comes to money, we are blessed with experts. When I go to Standard Bank or Cecil, I've got 28,000 remuneration experts helping me. <laughs> it's wonderful. Everyone has a view. Everyone gets paid. And then you've got folk like John Gatherer and Debbie Craig that say, actually, you know, what are you making this fuss about? Retention's easy. You've just got to do these five things. And when I looked at these five, I, I couldn't argue. I mean, it, it does look fantastic. That's all you have to do. We have to link pay to performance. And is there a link? So what we do is we take the whole Janusburg Stock Exchange companies. We take five years of their performance. We look at different things like turnover and profit and EBITDA. And then we look at the CO pay and we, we see if the two do this. In other words, highly correlated. Or if they do that. In other words, not highly correlated. And guess what? They are extremely highly correlated, which means that our pay in South Africa is extremely well governed and run. Now, that doesn't look like it from where you're sitting. From where you're sitting, CEO pay is doing this and company performance is doing that because our journalists are really good to find that one swallow. And that one swallow does not make a summer. <clears throat> it's even a joke among... <laughs> Our family, <laughs> big fat performance hours. How do you get a big fat performance bonus? So how much are these people actually earning? So this is not empirical research. This is just a pure survey that says, depending on your level in the business, on the median, you could earn that as a percentage of your package. Most people try for the upper quartile, which means at the top end of the business, you could earn approximately one times your salary in short-term incentives. Long-term incentives, the a lot of things changed, um, a few acts, Section 8C of the Income Tax Act, a few other things, and we're in long-term incentive redesign mode, but basically you get eight times your salary at the top end in terms of shares. Now, we're at a university, we're not listed, we have to compete with this. That's what the challenge is, is the share scheme. So a lot of non-listed companies have started implementing um, 
schemes called rolling incentives for, for, for their staff, and uh, it's something we could consider. Full shares is another word for free shares. You get it for free. Mahala. That's what you get as, as shares to try and keep you. Board performance is a big issue, and we need more of you on more boards in South Africa. The Institute of Directors, you can load your CV up there, and when they do searches for directors, they'll find your CV and put you on a board. I've just been put on the board of the HSRC, and board induction was yesterday and the day before, and it was very interesting because they want to make their articles and their publications on their website for free. And this whole thing of making it freely available is quite a big issue. So um, very interesting. The NRF is probably going to be part of my portfolio, so I'm going to learn all about that because I, I, I don't know how that works. <laughs> and what do these non-executive directors earn? Well, they earn about that much. So I, I'm a board member of um, a large listed ICT company, and I attend six meetings a year. Um, roughly speaking, six meetings a year is probably 100,000 rand a meeting for a day. <laughs> is that too much or too little? <laughs> too much. I get a pack. <laughs> now, we're going to have to look into Professor Pay, Prof, I tell you. So we get a pack this thick. It's got a 1,000 calculations in. I put it all into Excel spreadsheet. I make sure that I am... Um, uh, when there's a new, um, a new uh, product they want to do, I Google the best of the best and find out who, who's doing that. So I spend a week preparing for this meeting. And by the way, the Fiduciary Duty and the Companies Act are so tough that um, if you mess up, you can you go to jail. Let me ask another question, those that said it's too much. Would you go to jail for 100,000 rand? No. And um, I've got to the point where anything less than that, I'm, I'm going off those boards because the risk is just too much. Non-financial rewards is worth 10 times money. So those letters, those handshakes, that, that welcome letter, that noticing what someone did is, is worth gold. Don't let go of that. This, this thing of globalization, I tell you, it's hit absolutely everywhere. And, um, I was in Angola, and I took a plane back from Angola. They were on a, on a plane of 300 people. 200 were Chinese. 200. 200. And at the Angolan airport, they couldn't read a thing. And they asked me. I was standing there, and I helped one of them. And um, they were at the wrong gate. And then they followed me to my gate. And then... I had looked back, there's 200 people there. <laughs> Landed here at um, Oha Tambo. And I'm walking, I'm late. I, I go through South African passports and I look back and there's 200 Chinese guys behind me like this, clustered. And I'm saying, no, you go, go, you gotta go that way. And, and they like look at me and they, they don't know where to go. And, and have you ever thought that if a Chinese person lands at our timber, which is an international airport, right? They don't know what to do. And this ground staff couldn't help them. So then I said, no, you needed to go that way, you know, where it's not South African passports. And then they went there, but then, of course, they were in the wrong place because I didn't know they were in transit. So <laughs> those poor guys. <laughs> Oh, governance is a big issue. Closer alignment of pay. It is very close. I said the correlation is high, but it needs to be closer. This thing of the wage gap, what does that mean? I'll tell you exactly what it means in rands and cents. Basically, um, the, the, the wage gap or the pay gap is a social issue. And poor linkage of pay to performance is a business issue. This is something we can fix. That is something that takes a lot more... Um, time and trouble to fix. So if a CEO on average earns three and a half million on the stock exchange, that's what the average pay is of a CEO, and the lowest paid worker earns 43,000 on the stock exchange, that's the average. So of course, there's some are higher, some are lower, and just now I said 30, 40 million. Yes, the top ones earn 30, 40 million. Then you divide the one into the other, the pay gap ratio is 82. 
some companies and some countries like the United States don't take the lowest level worker, they take the median salary of everyone else in the company other than the CEO. And then, of course, the pay gap ratio is 14. So when you get onto the news and the TV and the radio and you've got Donny, Cra uh, what's not Donny, <laughs> Patrick Craven sitting next to you and you get into a big fight, it's because he's using one measure and I'm using the other measure. But basically, this is in line with the rest of the world. We're not out of kilter. One thing that he did ace me on, and that wasn't on TV two weeks ago, it was on the radio. He says, when you benchmark your top executives, which countries do you use other than South Africa? Which other countries do you use? And you would know it's from where and to where. So we, <laughs> we take England and Australia and Canada and USA. And he says then, why when you benchmark our workers, you compare us to Bangladesh and India <laughs> and China and all the low paying countries? And I suppose he makes a good point there. Flexibility is a really big issue. Um, people want more flexibility. So the questions that we ask there in our, in our empirical research is, how much flexibility do you want? What do you mean by flexibility? Because we, we don't know exactly what you mean by flexibility. All we can say is that the IPM in the United Kingdom asked their members if they'd rather have a pay increase or more flexibility, and 78% said more flexibility. That's quite a high number. And then you do reward preferences by life cycle. Where are you in the life cycle? Or generations. We can't prove the generation theory in South Africa, so um, we, we call it life cycle. But, but it's nice to talk about baby boomers and veterans and generation X and Y because kind of that's how people talk. And all the, the non-academic journals and papers talk like that. So we, we try and emulate it and try and find definitions for all of this. I found one for generation Y. <clears throat> it doesn't stand the test academically, but at least it, uh, I know what you mean. <laughs> so, Renal Ninaba does a PhD in 2009. I supervised it, and she did this Myers Briggs, you know, Myers Briggs personality type. And she looked at reward preferences by Myers Briggs without reading 450 pages, just with the eye, you can see that these folk have different preferences. And um, we found out exactly in this uh, research what people really want when you are um, attracting them, what retains them, and what motivates them. And by the way, money attracts finished and clock, boom. And motivate and retain, and we're talking about a big sample size here. It was just under 1,000 career and performance management. People want feedback. They want to know how they're doing, and they want to know they've got a career. And that, that's how you attract, motivate, and retain. What's nice about empirical research is actually putting numbers to some of the things that we kind of knew in our gut, but we didn't know how much or how. And, and that's, that, that, that's what excites me about getting involved with, with academia, just to, to put a bit more credibility to what's in our stomachs. We need more academics on boards. If, if you need help, I'll gladly help you because we, we've got to get a good brains trust on boards. It's, it's governing companies, it's steering the ship for the next 5, 10, 15 years. And uh, you do work really hard, I can tell you that. The pay is good, but um, one learns a lot. The pay models are very similar to this. You get paid for knowledge, experience, or track record. Responsible remuneration is a big theme internationally. We, we, we're now looking at ways of sustaining companies, paying responsibly. So you'll hear the CEOs of Anglo, Platinum, Lonman, and Impala saying um, things like, we, we've got no problem with 12,500 rand a month, but um, it's not sustainable. We need to do sustainable, responsible remuneration. And, and that's kind of what they um, are talking about. Media scrutiny is very strong in South Africa. I've offered to train all the journalists on how to value a share because they say Whitey Basson earned 59 million rand this year. He didn't. He had the shares for 20 years, but conveniently he took them in one year. Uh, but it, it's, it's, an, it's an ongoing battle. And um, the president did, in fact, take a 0% pay increase. I offered him zero. He took it. Um, and I think that sends a very good message to the rest and, and captains of industry. And the most common determinant, so one of the questions is how do you set CEO pay? This is how you set it. These are the criteria. But, but 
we need to partner good academia to say in a structural equation model, which one is the strongest predictor? Which one is the best one? If you could pick two or three, which two or three would you use? Because you can't pick all of them. So right now our research tells us that um, turnover, size, is the highest link to CEO pay is the size of the company. How can that be? And it's the truth, but if I want to grow my pay, then I just go on a big merger and acquisition trail and, and I can get my pay up. That can't be right. Shouldn't it be something else? So here's an opportunity to actually say, although this has been the trend for the last 50 years, we think it should be this. This is how you should set it. And, and by the way, if, if we got that answer, we would all be millionaires because everyone's looking for that answer. The whole world is. It can't be that difficult to answer. And I'm, I'm hoping to answer that question here before my time's up. So I really need your help. HR on the bottom line, if you run your HR really well, then um, your long-term total shareholder return is more than double than if you run it badly. And I picked this up off the internet by chance from a company called Watson White. And they said if you've got a high human capital index as opposed to a low human capital index, over a five-year period, it's almost double your total shelter return. That's quite big. We need to check whether that's applicable in South Africa. And why this thing caught my eye, what goes into the human capital index is good talent management and clear rewards and accountability. That's quite something. That's quite a compelling reason to do this well. My final slide before closing, and um, there are just a few slides on closing, is this whole thing of brand and EVP. We don't know enough about it. Um, is there a remuneration discount if you work here, and if so, how much? If that company phone markup, and by the way, my PA put this slide together. I said, pick some cool brands. This is what she picked. So if this company, this Ferrari, phoned me and said, do you want to come work here? My answer is, yeah. When can you start? Tomorrow morning's fine. How much can we pay you? Don't worry, we'll sort it out at the end of the month. You know, so I'm prepared to take a remuneration discount for a cool brand. If the post office phoned me, <laughs> I'd want 20, 30% more. So do organizations with uncool brands pay more? That's interesting. That's interesting. That's a good question. I, I don't know the answer, by the way. I, I just, I really don't know. So um, that's an area for research that we are trying to, um, I, I did promise you I had more questions than, 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 than articles, and then I'm posing them all out, and I'm hoping to entice you to come help me a bit. Um, but it's, it's, it's a real big question. There was a company with a really bad brand that turned it into a good brand, and now they've got a waiting list, and that's SARS. When I was young, my father used to take a bus into one Rissick Street and pay SARS, and everyone hated SARS. And when I went to the military, they, they got people from the military to come work there because no one would work there. Now there's a queue. They've got CAs lining up because they want SARS on the CV. So Praveen, in his day, he turned that thing around. So that's, that's what we need to be doing. So in closing, and just a few closing thoughts around talent and remuneration and reward and um, the linkage is, um, I love this word uh, crisis in English, in, 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 in Mandarin it means opportunity. And, and we do need to look for the opportunities and find out what they are. And uh, what is Africa's opportunity? I always try and find opportunities for Africa and the economist found it. They think Africa is a pretty cool place, it's growing at around 8% and by the way, we have all the arable land and the mineral resources. So it's growing. I was sitting on an airplane and I saw this. I didn't, I didn't know which magazine it was, but um, Awaken the Sleeping Giant. Africa is set to become the next economic powerhouse. So there's a whole lot of people believing in Africa. Credible people. And Africa is big. That's China. There's United States, <laughs> Spain, France. India, Japan, UK, we're big. We really are. And we're growing at 8%. This juggernaut is growing at 8%. This is the best place to be. It really is. 
And I'm so excited about it. But we're running out of time. We've got to get it right soon. And I hope you forgive that I'm going to end on a humorous note. So please just take it for the humor that, what, that it was intended. <clears throat> the year man becomes immortal, then computers are going to do everything by 2045. Everything. And even my wife, you know, and I had this conversation and I said, darling, you know, not everything. <laughs> And she said, yes, darling, everything. <laughs> and by the way, he doesn't snore. <laughs> well done. Thanks for listening. <laughs> uh, what a privilege to be here. Thank you so much for listening and giving up your time. Time is the most valuable thing you can give, and, and you've given that to me. Thank you so much. <laughs>